I have had the good fortune of owning and reviewing all of the wood stoves in the Bushcraft Essentials lineup. Everything from the Micro all the way up to the Bushbox XL. Well, now there's a new stove in the Bushcraft Essentials lineup, introducing the Bushbox XXL Campfire. If you're interested in hearing my thoughts on this rather big stove, keep watching. Before we begin, I'd just like to thank Detlev at Bushcraft Essentials for sending out the XXL campfire so that I could share it with you. I've had this stove for quite a while. I've built a good number of fires in it. I've gotten very used to it. So what I thought I would do is take you down to the tabletop. I'm going to take the stove apart, put it back in its case, reassemble it, give you its key features, give you its specifications. But of course, we're going to get outside and build a fire in it. All right, let's get started. So here is the stove all put back in its carry case. I'll just speak to the carry case for a moment before we take the components out and put the stove together. So the case is very much like a lot of the cases that come from Bushcraft Essentials for the other stoves, made of a very heavy duty Cordura nylon, assembled along its seams with nylon webbing, held together with Velcro, as you'll see in a moment. One of the feature, or two of the features, I guess, on the back of the package is these two straps, presumably belt loops, but honestly, you're not carrying this on your belt or hanging it from the D-ring that's included of it. Uh, it's just a bit too heavy. The whole package, as I have it right now with these components, as you'll see in a moment, comes in at seven pounds, 12 ounces, yes, yeah, seven pounds, 12 ounces, almost eight pounds. So it's 3.5 kilograms, just over 3.5 kilograms here. Now there is one optional piece I'll share with you in a minute. Now, having said that, if you wanted to leave one or two of the pieces at home, you'll save a little bit of weight, but not much. All right, let's just take everything out. So to start with, off of the top, the ash pan and fire grate, put those aside. A pair of trivets, put those aside. And the remainder of the components, let me put the case aside. Okay, there are two side, or these are end pieces, I guess is the best way to describe it, that are identical, as you can see. But one of them is an option, or as an option, I should say, you get this piece as well. So you can use it as a fire pit where you would feed wood in from the top, or you can use it like this, more like a traditional wood stove with an open feed port on the side. I'm gonna set it up with this one today because I think that's what most people relate to in this, this type of stove. But just know that the option is there for both. In fact, I may demonstrate it with both when we get it outside. So that's the one we're gonna keep. And we're just gonna set this piece aside. Now, to put this together, we have two longer pieces, which I equate as the sides. When I say longer, they're only about a half inch longer, but they are just a little bit longer. I'll take the back, that's the way I'm gonna name this. And you will notice that on the back, there are tabs that reach out, three of them on each side, and they're slotted to fit in downwards. They correspond with tabs on the longer sides, which reach out and face upwards. So there's where you would put them together. So I'll start with two like this, and they lock together. I need the other longer side. And if it's not gonna make sense for you right now, it will in a moment there. Now, doing this from a sitting position is always a little awkward when you're on camera. Okay, so we've got two of them. Now I'm gonna do this in reverse. This is where things are gonna get challenging for me so that you can see what I am doing. But uh, yeah, that's what's important, of course. Okay, so now the next pieces would be the ash pan, which goes right at the bottom. Projected tabs here on three sides to match slots on those three sides. So those are gonna go in. Now I'll tell you, there is a little bit of fiddling maybe when you get to this point, just to line everything up just until you get the last piece uh, assembled. Again, here is the fire grate, tabs on three sides. That's gonna go in just like the ash pan is. Keep everything lined up and operating at the same time. I can close over this other side. All right, so I've got everything except the front piece on, so let's get that on. So the front piece, like the back piece, has the tabs that project down three to a side. And now it's just a matter of lining those all up. And this is where the hand-eye coordination comes into play for this to make sure that it locks on. I'm not locked in quite yet. There we go, that side. 
And uh, yeah, okay, I am. I'm there all locked in. Now I'm going to say this right now, and I'll say it again probably. Once you get it assembled like this, its own weight, more or less, is what's keeping it assembled, keeping it from falling apart. I will also say that once it starts to get hot, it will hold together. You won't actually, you not, not that you would even try to get it apart while it's hot, but it actually helps to hold it together. But if you have to at this point, pick it up and move it, do it from the tall sides. Do it from these tall sides, not the front of the back, because if you lift those up, then it's going to fall apart, of course. Okay, so now we have the stove fully assembled. Might as well keep operating it from here. Now, there are the trivets, and the trivets, very much like the trivets for the other stoves, give you options in terms of the depth for each of the slots. And at the same time, on the long sides and on the front here, you have options for uh, where you want to put it. So how far you want to put them apart. Either way, you have all kinds of options. And that's just very characteristic of even the Bushbox XL. You just have a great number of options. But there is one feature on these that is not a, the same as on the um, Bushcroft XL. I'm going to come in a little closer. Hopefully you'll be able to see that. On the end, in addition to the two slots here, there is a 45 degree slot. And that is for this moving the stove. So on the sides of the taller sides, you'll see these slots. Same on both sides, of course. Put them in at that 45 degrees. And if, for whatever reason, you had to move the stove while it was lit, you can do it safely with your hands well away and without any risk of the stove falling apart. So just a nice little extra feature. Honestly, if you've set up in the, re in the best place, you're not likely to want to move the stove, but it's good to know you can safely without risk of it falling apart and coming apart and going everywhere all over the ground. So I just think I'll just set those over the top for now. On like that. And like that, we'll be using them in a few moments time in different ways. Now, let's just go around the stove and talk about it a little bit, and then I'll give you some measurements. So one of the things I want to mention right up front is I showed three tabs, three tabs, absolutely essential on the stove this big. This is very heavyweight stainless steel, just the same. This stove will see it will get very, very hot when you get a large fire going in it. Those three tabs help to ensure minimal warping. I didn't say no warping, because there is, there will be some warping, but minimizes the warping, doesn't allow the sides to expand out too far. So that's an important component feature, design feature. As is the design all the way around. So the Bushcraft Essentials uh, emblem cut into it here. But you can see this design all the way around, a series of triangles. That's on both sides, the end plate, and the other end plate, if you want to replace it. I'll talk more about this end plate in a second. So what's the purpose of that? Those are there also to aid in uh, expansion and contraction of the stove as it gets hot. To minimize warping, to keep the thing from warping in any direction, these things will actually allow the stove to flex without actually over uh, flexing or over moving with the heat. So they are a critical component to the design of this stove. Of course, you have the ash or the fire grate inside and the ash pan underneath, also important. Now, if you wanted to save a few ounces, yes, you could do that by dropping the ash pan out of this, as long as you knew what type of a fire safe surface you were going to use this on top of. But realistically, you're not saving it enough weight to make it worthwhile. You might as well put it in and keep it there. It does serve another function, which is to keep the stove warmer, longer. I'll explain what I mean about that in a moment. Okay, so some of the things that are not here, well, you can do this, but it doesn't really advantage you any. The slots that I use to move the stove, you could also slide the trivets through so that you can get a lower setting. Get it off the top here get a lower slit setting if you wanted to drop it, the a bigger pot down inside. Now, the thing is, is there's only the one position there, so it, there's not a lot of versatility in this, but you can see if I can tilt it again. If you've got a pot that's almost the same size as the stove itself, then it will sit on top of those, but there are options if you want to sit the stove down inside as well. Let me just pull these out. Okay, so I mentioned there are two panels, 
for this. There is this one, the open uh, box panel, the feed port as you would have on most wood stoves, and a solid panel. And the reason being is when this stove was first conceived, it was conceived as a campfire. This is something that you would build, obviously, okay, it's not a backpacking stove. Let's just clear that up right away. Not at almost eight pounds. This is not a backpacking stove. This is a car camping stove. This is an alternative to an open fire at a campsite. So that's what this is all about. And it really excels at that. So this is your campfire. Good, it's good to know that. Still can be used as a cooking stove, as you'll see. But when it was first conceived, it was thought you're not going to be using this so much for cooking as you are for just building a nice big fire in. Yes, you could boil water on it. You can put a fry pan on top and those types of things. But it is much more efficient uh, fuel-wise and airflow-wise if this panel is installed in the front. However, that does mean that you're going to be feeding all the wood in from the top. So the decision was made to include an optional open feed port traditional to most of the Bushcraft Essential stoves so that you can leave a pot on or a pan on and just feed smaller sticks as you need to to manage the heat. So that's why it's like that. There are two of these on this stove. All right, let's go through a few of the specifications for the stove. So I did say it was heavy, coming in at seven pounds, 12 ounces, or 3.5 kilograms. Yes, it is a heavy stove. And that's due to the fact that it is made from 1.5 millimeter thick stainless steel. Had to be that thick to withstand the uh, ultra high temperatures that are generated by a big fire in this. Now, the height wise from the table to the top, 10.63 inches or 270 millimeters. It is square, so it's the same across, 8.35 inches or 212 millimeters. Those are the basic specifications for this stove. What I want to do now is just reset it up in another configuration to show you a little bit of the versatility you can get from this stove. All right, I moved the panel with the feed port on it and put the full uh, side panel on, but I did it for a reason so I could show you one, it in that configuration, but also this. Can you see this little half moon notch right here? I wasn't even sure what that was for, so I reached out to Detlev and this is what he showed me. I'll turn it all the way around and you can guess. Yes, that's the feed hose from our feed hose from a remote feed gas stove. So I'll turn it up on its side so that you can see I have, it's not centered right now, but it would be if you went to use it. That's the Fire Maple Blade 2 Titanium uh, gas stove. So that's what I have set up in there. That's what that hole is all about so that you can adapt the stove for use with gas if that's what you want to do. Now there is another way of doing that that I think is actually a little bit easier and I'll show you that now. So it'll take me again just a moment to reset this up and show you how it can be used not only with a gas stove but also with an alcohol stove. All right so what I did this time is took one of the front panels off of the side panels, left it open on three sides except I took one of the trivets with its notches and inserted it in those lugs at the bottom to stabilize everything. So it's holding everything together, but in three-sided mode. Now you can probably see the advantages already. We're not using this as a wood stove so much as we're using it as a wind screen, a support for different stoves in it. So for instance, if I wanted again to use a gas stove, I could do so inside with the remote feed coming out through there. I have easy access for lighting it, putting my pot on and the like. I have an open side, but I have the other three sides protected from the wind. Alternatively, if I wanted to use an alcohol stove, in this case represented by my small Silverant titanium alcohol stove here, I can center that. Now, here's the thing. Um, the stove is not designed primarily around the use of either the gas or the alcohol, so you do have to make some adaptations. And here's what I found were the easiest thing to do. and actually works out pretty well at that. I picked up a couple of skewers. Now, I haven't cut them to length, but I will be doing so. And what I found is that with all those holes running down the sides, I can choose the one I want to get to the level I want above the stove. I think I'll go one higher here just to give you an idea. Put it through. All right, so now I have my skewers through. I don't think I have them at the same height. No, I don't, so down one. Yeah, I think that'll work. All right, so now I have the skewers set through 
at as a pot rest on, over top of my alcohol stove. And because there are so many different types of alcohol stoves out there with different pot or different sizes, you can adjust your skewers to whatever the best height is to get the best pot gap. I like one and a quarter to one and a half with a stove like this, but if you want to get down lower with a trangia, some people think one inch, but really whatever works for you. So having skewers like this or a tent peg, because a tent uh, it would have to be quite a long tent peg, but a tent peg could be put through here or anything else of metal that you can put through to support your pot on top of will work for this. And as I said, uh, these are a full size skewer. I just haven't cut them to the length I want. So I'll probably cut them to the same length as the trivets so that I can pack them in the bag and they're still going to be plenty long enough. Another factor, of course, or another uh, versatility piece of having trivets like this or skewers like this is that you can set them on top in those little slots intended for the trivets and of course use them as skewers for roasting things on on top of the stove. All right so this is the primary setups just before we get outside I want to talk about use with other fuels. All right the last thing I want to talk about before we get outside and light this stove up is use with other fuels other than wood. So we have talked about using it with a gas stove and with an alcohol stove certainly you can use it with a solid fuel tablet like an Esbit or an alcohol gel it would just mean some type of a little holder that you would set up inside same place you would use with the alcohol stove and use the skewers or something similar to give you the height over top that you're looking for the other two fuels that i often like to use with stoves like this are wood pallets and charcoal well Wood pallets are not going to work in this stove, at least the way it is built right now. There may be some modifications come up with some type of a screen that would be preclude pellets falling through the holes. I might try that, but once again, this really is a campfire. That's what it was designed for. That's where the primary intent is. So as a campfire, the fire grate is exactly the size you want it to be. If you want to use it with pellets, yeah, you can, uh, but you're going to need to find something inside to keep the pellets from falling through. And of course, the last fuel, then this is legitimate for what this stove is designed for, and that is charcoal. I do love using charcoal with these things. They make excellent fire pits. They really do work well. But a few words on this. Number one, you're going to want to replace the open front with the solid front so that you can maximize the heat and, of course, keep your charcoal from falling out. Doing that will actually turn this into a bit of a rocket stove. I'm not claiming it's a rocket stove, but it will give it more of a chimney effect because all the air that's being dropped up through the bottom and in through the sides will go up through. You won't lose any out of the front. So yes, replace it with the solid pan if you're going to use charcoal. The other thing I'll say about charcoal, if you've ever done this with one of these stoves, is it can get hot, really, really, really hot. So don't overload it with charcoal. Start with less than you think you need. You can always add more, but if you add too much, you can, you can introduce an awful lot of heat and then you're just waiting for it to cool down. So that's my experience with charcoal. Okay, uh, we're ready to get outside and light this up. As I get myself ready for this demonstration here, it is a beautiful early November day. But we had about four centimeters of snow overnight and the temperatures are hovering right around freezing. So it's a little bit chilly, but it has nothing to do with the performance of the stove. Um, I'm going to make it easy on myself today. A little bit of wood wool. Light that. Drop that in the center. My first few sticks in are some broken pine. I could drop them in from the top or I could drop them in from the side like I'm doing here. They light up so nice and fast, and they're so dry as well. It'll take a second for that to really catch on, of course. And it will be smoky, because it is pine. And once that gets going, then I'll start feeding in some hardwoods. See if we can get a, get a real roaring fire going in this. I think what I might do at this point is just to speed up the time on video a little bit, just so that uh, it gets going this month faster.
All right, I moved the camera around just a little bit because it had occurred to me when I looked through the view screen that the sun seemed to be cancel out, canceling out some of the flame so that it made it hard for you to see. So I think you can see now just how much flame I have inside of this stove. So I think what I'll do is just reposition the camera a tiny bit, more about lifting it up and bringing it back a little bit so you can see when I put on my 16 centimeter zebra billy pot because the stove really kind of makes the pot look small doesn't it normally that is that's a pot that's way too big for just about any wood stove certainly would sit on the outside of it not this one though this one is actually a good fit and while I have that on there I'll mention that I've also placed large 10 inch cast iron fry pans on here and a little bit bigger in diameter of course but still works very nice there's plenty of clearance for flame to come out underneath and of course cast iron, cast iron does such a great job at dissipating the heat all the way through it that uh, yeah this is a good stove for cooking with cast iron even large cast iron dutch ovens would work a while on this stove and the other thing I hope that I showed up is just how you can manage longer pieces of wood in through the port here. Let's see what I have for an example. So a little piece of birch, what is that? A little over 10 inches. And I've got all but a two inches maybe inside of the stove itself. So you can use some pretty big pieces of wood in this stove. Thought I'd offer you one more shot from another angle. Just a beautiful thing to be able to sit here and watch this fire inside of this Bushcraft Essentials Bushbox XXL campfire. All right, just before we wrap this video up, I just want to share some of my experiences with you of testing and using this stove over the last couple of months. So one of the burns I did with the stove is what I would call an extended burn. It was at least three hours long. I just kept loading wood into it for almost three hours, probably about five loads worth of wood is what it came out to. I did that for two reasons. I wanted to see how the stove would respond to the extreme heat that that type of a fire would create. And I wanted to see what kind of an ash buildup I would get in the bottom of this stove. So let's talk about the ash buildup first. So um, as you can imagine, all that wood would create a lot of ash. But when I let the stove die out and went back to check after it was cold, I was very pleasantly surprised to see that there was just a thin layer of white ash on sitting on top of the fire grate, meaning that it had very efficiently burned up all the wood. Now it was hardwood. I did use softwood to get the fire going. I don't really do that just to get it going quickly. And then I used hardwood for as much as I can. It's the cleaner burning of the fuel, also the hotter burning of the fuel. But all I was left with was just a little bit of ash on top of the fire plate. Now, there was some ash that had moved down through the fire grate on top of the ash pan. I'll just pick the stove up and show you. You can see that there is a little better than an inch between the fire, the ash pan here and the fire grate here. So there was some ash trapped inside of there. Again, not near as much as I thought there would be. Uh, it was easy enough once I disassembled the stove, I was able to deposit the ash where I needed to, and I was ready to put it back together again. However, had I used the stove for a much longer period of time, maybe like you might around a campsite on a winter's evening, which you could probably see it going five hours from supper right through to bedtime, then you would probably get enough ash to fill the ash pan up that inch and a half. That'd be a lot of ash, mind you. But if you did, I still don't think it would affect the burning of the stove because even with the ash pan filled up to the fire grate, there's still all kinds of airflow around the sides of the stove so that the stove would continue to burn quite efficiently. That's my belief. I didn't go past three hours as I mentioned. So the other thing I was looking for was warping. I wanted to know does the metal of this stove warp under extreme heat and the answer is yes it does. Now I want to qualify that. First off warping. It's not necessarily a bad thing. All metal will warp when it's exposed to stress like extreme heat. This stove is no different than that. The question is, is the warping going to affect the functionality of the stove? And the answer to that is no. 
or at least not very much. I'll explain. So yes, I did get some warping and I'm, I'll be able to show you that. Here's a couple places where I got some warping. So this is the side panel that you would use if you wanted to remove the one with the feed port. And there is the worst warping that's occurred on the stove. It's right here where the fire grate would insert. Hopefully that's showing up. You can see this where it's belled out a little bit right here. That's the worst of the warping on the entire stove. Now, the rest of the side panels, they had slight bows outwards. The fire grate had a slight bow inwards. They did not in any way affect the assembly of the stove the next time I used it. But here's what I did after that and what I would recommend. If you notice that the sides and the fire grate are bowing a little bit under the heat, reverse them. The next time you go to assemble the stove, if they were bowing out or bowing down, flip them upside down, turn them inside out, and with the heat of the next fire, they'll come back into true, or at least pretty close into true. So at no time did I actually have a difficulty getting the stove together. A few times I had to give it a little bit of push in order to get the locking lugs on, but in fact, I see that as a bit of a benefit. The spring in the steel at that point actually helped lock the stove together. So I didn't see bowing or warping as a, a bad thing. Now, the truth of it was, I probably should not have fed the stove that hot to, for that long a period of time. Uh, that's not the way you would normally use Bushcraft Essential Stove. You put in enough uh, wood to get the fire going that you need for the chore you're doing, usually cooking. But this is a campfire. This is not just an extra large cook stove. This is a campfire. And I know many people are going to want to overfill the stove. Resist the urge if you can, but know that if you do put a lot of wood in this stove, it's going to warp a little bit, but nothing that's going to be terminal. Nothing that's going to make it very hard to put back together the next time. All right, so that's everything I wanted to say about the stove. Again, this is not a backpacking stove. This is a car camping stove. I don't want anybody telling me this is way too heavy for backpacking. No argument here. That's the reason I did this in the backyard and this part of the review here in my home. Is I, this, I wasn't going to carry this into the woods. Ah, okay. Everything I've given you in terms of specifications will be in the video description. The links to where you can take another look at the stove will be in the video description. If you have any comments or questions about the Bushcraft Essentials Bushbox XXL Campfire, put them in the comments section below. But until next time, get out and explore and take that path less traveled because it will make all the difference. Bye for now.